Thank you so much for joining our family as we attempt to do a tribute to our mother. As I was walking up and down the aisles, it was hard to get the other end because there were so many people to say hi to. But I would imagine that would be normal. Our extended family also enjoys and appreciates the effort that everybody made to get here. Our extended family is far and wide. Going through an airport in Hong Kong, I had somebody yell out my name. I'm like, what? Why would anybody here know who I was? So I stopped, I looked around. I didn't recognize anybody. Finally, after the third time they called out my name, I'm like, oh, that gentleman over there is calling my name. So as we gathered and met amongst the, the bustling airport, he said, you are a Bennett, are you not? I said, yes. And he goes, uh, Fred Bennett? I said, yeah, I'm a Fred Bennett. He goes, oh, no. He says, the Fred Bennett I knew was in college with me. I said, well, if he went to Walla Walla, that's my dad. So we appreciate the friendships and hope that you get a glimpse of what we're trying to portray and the tribute that we're giving to our mom. Thanks. I'm John Stafford, part of the Bennett extended family. I considered uh, Fred and Jane Ann like my brother and sister. And uh, from Kirkland days, you'll see some of those pictures. But uh, Fred was my brother Tom Stafford's roommate here at Walla Walla. And then Fred and Jane Ann got together, and uh, I was in their wedding, I think. Anyway, uh, uh, as I got up through Auburn Academy and into college my freshman year, uh, I stayed in the dorm, sophomore year at Cologne, and then junior and senior, I was staying with uh, Fred and Jane Ann in the, in the basement of their house. And uh, I enjoyed staying with them, eating their food, and, and uh, the wonderful example that they have been to me. Jane has been like a sister for me as well. Anyway, I was asked to give an obituary for, of her life. This is an honor. Jane Ann Schlatter was born in George and Mar born to George and Margaret Werner Schleider in Devil's Lake, North Dakota on April 8, 1933. In 1934, her sister Betty Lou was born. The family moved to Fargo, and later, when Jane Ann was around nine years old, they moved to Summit, Washington. They moved to North Hill for a time and then settled in Puyallup, Washington, where Jane Ann graduated from Puyallup High School in 1951. She worked for an attorney in Puyallup, but dreamed of becoming a nurse. In 1954, Jane Ann's dad encouraged her to attend Walla Walla College, where Frederick Roland Bennett found her and decided she was beautiful. And I agree with that. I think we all do. Talented, creative, and kind. And on June 12, 1955, they were married in Puyallup, Washington. They moved to Pasco, Washington, and then on to Bremerton, Washington, where they had two children, Jenna, Quayle, and Fred. In 1960, they moved in in order for Fred to teach at Walla Walla College, and they lived at 12 North College Avenue. In College Place, Fred and Jane Ann developed a neighborhood 
and built a house at 36 Tremont Drive. They had two more children, George and Carol, Carol Bovee today. Jane Ann and Fred shared a mutual love for music, and Jane Ann played the piano beautifully. She taught piano lessons and babysat for years until 1971 when she began working at Walla Walla Valley Academy as an assistant to the treasurer. She worked at Walla Walla Valley Academy for years, balancing the ledgers, assisting the registrar in grades, and coordinating with student workers. An extra job that she loved was banquet planning with student leaders. She retired from Walla Walla Valley Academy in 1999. Sometimes ser serving as a deaconess, sometimes a pianist, Jane Ann also taught children's Sabbath school classes for years at the Walla Walla College and now University Church, where she was a member since 1960. She developed programs, wrote songs, and gathered supplies, some that are still used today. Jane Ann was a behind-the-scenes support to her husband of 60 years, right up until his death in 2015. Jane Ann passed away on June 24, 2022, looking forward to seeing all her loved ones in heaven again. And we are looking forward to seeing her again, are we not? Jane Ann loved and served her family and leaves behind her four children and their spouses. Jen and Leonard Quayle, Fred and Joylene Bennett, George and Janine Bennett, and Carol and Randy Bovey. Grandchildren in order of birth are Nathan Quayle, who has deceased, Colt and his wife Jennifer Smith, Janetta and Jared Meharry, Stacy and Lance Maxted, Marianne Quayle, Trevor Bennett, Leanna and Trey Decker, Larissa Bovey, Karina Bovey, Nicole Bennett Gomes, and Andrew Bovey. Great grandchildren include Mackenzie and Peyton Smith, Joshua, Josiah, JCL, and Jayla Mihiri, Chloe and Oliver Maxted, and Zachary Decker. Nominations may be made in Jane Ann's memory to the Walla Walla University. Dr. Frederick and Jane Ann Bennett Endowed Engineering Scholarship Fund.
came to Dad's service seven years ago, we thank you even more because that one was very long. This one is a little different design because Mom and Dad were as different as night and day. The saying is that opposites attract, and Fred and Jane Ann Bennett were the picture of that. Dad was outgoing, and Mom was an introvert. Dad was up front, Mom was behind the scenes. Dad could talk to anyone and remember their name and not remember their names. When he was done, he would say, who is that? And mom could supply the name, the name of the extended family, their last three known addresses, and their criminal record. I'm just kidding. She only knew their last two addresses. Mom was organized, efficient, on time, and expected others to be the same, and dad was not. Um, Dad was the one with the plaques on the wall, the diplomas and the achievements and the recognition. Um, he had rooms named after him. Mom didn't. And growing up, I used to wonder how they even got together. But one summer, Dad and I got trapped together. I was working on my master's thesis, and he was home recuperating from chemotherapy, radiation, and a surgery. Neither one of us wanted to be where we were, and so we did what the Bennetts can do, we put off what we needed to do and instead told stories. It started with us staring at the wall of plaques that I just mentioned. I asked how he felt about having all of those plaques, and he grunted, your mom put them there, I didn't. And I said, yeah, but you earned them, how does that feel? And he humphed and he said, those would not be there without your mom. Dad spoke of meeting mom. He went with, his, with Uncle Tom, actually, to some evangelistic series in Tacoma. And he and Uncle Tom were up in the balcony, and he saw this beautiful young lady walking down the aisle, and she went all the way to the front to the piano. Man, that was checking off some boxes for him because he wanted a wife that could play the piano. And he turned to his roommate, and he said, I'm going to marry that girl. And his roommate said, yeah, in your dreams. <laughs> Dad is nothing if not persisted, so he pursued her after the meeting, and he got introduced to Jane Ann Schlater. He made it his business to stick around long enough to find out where she needed to go, and he provided a ride for her and her group of friends. He had her in the car. But she got out, thanked him for the ride, and walked away, shot down. Dad says that he went back to college thinking he was a senior at Walla Walla College, and everybody knows you better find a wife before you graduate. And his walked away from his car. So he was out for registration and up the sidewalk between the gateway of service on the way to the ad building, up walks Jane Ann Schlater. He was so happy. He went up to her and greeted her and said, Jane Ann, I had no idea you were coming. I'm so glad you're here. And she said, I'm sorry, have we met? Oh, man. But again, dad's persistent. He got to know her. He and, um, they, they went out and he even got to go to her house in Puyallup and meet the family, his, her sister, um, Aunt Betty, and her parents. And he said she knew how to do family. She had all the boxes. She was kind. She was talented. She was creative. But he had one more thing he wanted to know. So he went into the office of the academic dean. Now, my dad tells me that he was always acquainted with the academic dean, and it wasn't for his star qualities. Um, so he went in, and the guy said, what are you here for this time? And dad said, no, really, I just want to know Jane Ann Schlater's IQ score. And the dean said, what? Why do you want to know that? And dad said, well, see, she's kind. She knows how to do family. She's creative, she sews, she plays the piano, she's all the things I ever wanted, but I want to make sure that I have a wife that can walk with me. And I read that if you want intelligent kids, you need an intelligent mother, so I, I just, you know, it's my last box, come on. And the dean put mom's folder down on the table and he said, I'll tell you what, Fred, I'm not going to tell you her IQ score, but good luck keeping up with her. And dad says he left the office and made plans to propose. He told me all those years later as we sat in their downstairs office on 36th Street Mott Drive, he told me how much he valued their differences. 
The services for mom and dad are different, but it's important to all of us kids and all of the Bennett family that you understand that we value mom just as much as dad. But she would have shuddered and complained already. It's too long and too much about her. Mom had no rooms named after her. She only had two plaques and an embroidered pillow from Walla Walla Valley Academy. But Jane Ann Schlater Bennett has given us a huge legacy in her own introverted, efficient, and organized way. See, it was mom who read us the little friend in the primary treasures, who practiced our memory verses with us and tucked us into bed at night. It was mom who taught children Sabbath school since the beginning of time through when I graduated from college. It was mom who began to teach each of us to play the piano starting at the age of four, or at least she tried. And it was mom who guided our practice sessions on the piano or other instruments by hollering timing from the kitchen or telling us to slow down, count, play that right. Consequently, you heard Jana is amazing on the piano. Fred plays the trumpet and sings. George plays the violin and I play the flute. And all of our kids are musical as well. It was mom who taught us to read by reading to us endlessly. It was mom who took us to doctor's appointment and ensured that we all got braces and wore our headgear and thoroughly brushed our teeth. It was mom who took me to endless eye doctors and it was at her tears of joy that I saw when I got my first pair of contacts and informed her that I could see her wrinkles. It was mom who crawled on her hands and knees. Sorry. <laughs> all over her second, my second grade classroom looking for that missing contact. And of course, it was mom who found it. It was mom's determination that ensured that Friday night vespers happened at our house, and it was mom who played the piano and her children, until her children took over the job. Friday night memories are the, sound, uh, are the scent of candles and oil of Olay, the sight of curlers and cleanliness and the sound of mom bent over the banister hollering, Fred, come for worship. It was our squeaky clean mom who allowed us to play in the mud or work on greasy cars and other projects as long as the clothes went immediately into the hamper to preserve the pristine condition of the house. It was mom who drove every field trip that Clara E. Rogers Elementary School ever had from the time Jana started until I finished. It was mom who brought cookies and other food to class parties, who took meals to sick people and provided food for receptions and funerals and sandwiches to the firefighters. It was mom who was almost always home when we got home from school. And it was mom who allowed us to have friends over at will if we notified her first. It was mom who would drive out on stormy days or when I stayed out too late, coming home from school. I would see that blue suburban go by and know that I was in trouble but I also knew that I was safe. Mom always knew where we were. How many times did that whistle call us home? It was mom who taught my sister and I to sew, and it was mom who stayed up late sewing for last minute events. One time I came home and said I had to have a pilgrim dress. She sewed it out of crepe paper because we didn't have material. I remember that I couldn't move because it would tear. I don't know how many double-knit polyester outfits that we had. You might have seen a quilt out there in the foyer. It's quite hideous. And yes, we wore everything represented in that quilt. <laughs> and it was mom who put up with my tantrum for my very first banquet at Walla Walla Valley Academy. I wanted a new dress, and I wanted a gunny sacks dress. Like everybody else, I wanted to be cool. Mom said we didn't have the money for cool. So we went to the bargain basement material store. Some of you might remember it. It smelled like popcorn. I don't remember which one it was on Isaac's, but it smelled like popcorn. And we dug through the clearance rack and mom found material. And she swore that she could put five patterns together and make me a stylish dress. And I knew better. And like all mature young ladies ready for their first banquet, I kind of threw a fit. She bought the material anyway, and I didn't cooperate at any level. And the day before the banquet, as I pouted yet again about helping her sew this dress that I knew that was going to be awful, she said, Carol, go to bed. No, 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 I'm good. I got it. Attitude's gone. We'll sew. We're good. Nope, go to bed. I'm done with you. 
we didn't talk back much at our house, so I went up the stairs and I threw myself on my bed and I sobbed at my poor pitiful life without a gunny sack dress. And when I woke up in the morning, on the back of my door was a completed dress with ribbons and lace and bows and everything I did not deserve. A perfect story would say to you that I loved that dress and that I never threw a fit again, but I'm not perfect. And the dress of it oddly, but I have never forgotten knowing that mom had to have stayed up all night long to finish that dress for a young lady with an attitude. That is the definition of grace. It was mom <clears throat> who scoured pawn shops to find me a flute that I had been begging for for years. And she drove me to flute lesson after flute lesson. It was mom who sat through every band concert, every choir performance, every singer's concert, Blue Mountain Youth Orchestra concerts without complaint. But it was also mom who breathed a huge sigh of relief when I told her that she did not have to sit through the Walla Walla Symphony concerts. <laughs> It was mom who forced us to do chores, nagged at us to be clean, hounded us to pick up after ourselves, and generally taught us to be responsible. And she taught us to take care of things. If you've been to our house, you have to have seen this. All of the grandchildren recognize this, and it comes with the word no. Don't touch the green leaf. We take care of our things. This green leaf was bought on a, on a vacation in Canada, if I remember, somewhere between the time I was seven and 10. And I swear to you that it's in better condition now than when she bought it. Generations have passed through this green leaf. It's in, it's in pristine condition. It's a family joke, this green leaf. But it is mom taking care of things and I just want to point out that it's not an antique and it's not vintage. It was bought when I was young, so it's just special. <laughs> it was mom who balanced a budget for a family of six on an income built for two. She baked and cooked and balanced meals, canning, gardening, beans in the pressure cooker, bread in the oven. Those all bear mom's name. And while it was dad who delighted in sailing, it was mom who went with him, dreading it, detesting it, and fearing it but also enjoying the family time and allowing us to grow up loving sailing. It was mom who helped pack for trips and allowed my first solo adventure my year in Spain. She didn't let me go quietly understand. I heard of the evils of strangers and the danger of traveling alone and how to guard my money and take care of myself, but I went. And another thing about trips, mom was a navigator. She delighted in maps. She would call frequently while we were traveling and she would say, where are you now? She's also the one in, in our family who kept track of everybody's birthdays, anniversaries, and any other special day. Somebody's gotta take on that job now. And it was mom who took care of my sister and I after the birth of each of our children. For those times when the child didn't want to be born on time, she insisted that it must come soon as she had a flight to catch. The child always obeyed grandma because there isn't really another option, although Karina and Marianne both pushed the boundaries there. Mom was one of the first to visit us in the children's hospital when Andrew had leukemia, and it was mom who checked daily on his progress. And as time progressed, she checked on my sanity as well. She drove eight hours to my house to cook and clean and do laundry to give me a break. It was mom who showed us how to care for an aging parent, taking excellent care of her own mother through day-to-day -day care from just down the street. Dad, dad was always strong and opinionated, robust and capable, but in the end, when his Alzheimer's made life difficult, it was mom who was his rock. He turned to her for direction, for care, and for comfort. Between God and mom, dad seemed to feel safe, and in the, even in those moments when he wasn't sure of who she was, he knew without a doubt that he could depend upon her. Mom and dad were as different as night and day. 
but they were as completely united on two things, loving and serving God and raising children who would do the same. Their children, grandchildren, and now great-grandchildren have been and always will be blessed by that legacy handed down from Fred and Jane Ann Bennett, unalike but perfect partners, brought together by God for his purpose. Dad and Mom will be side by side up in Mount Hope Cemetery, buried near the Cross family who took my dad in upon his arrival to Walla Walla College and adopted Mom to their hearts not long after. And someday soon, Jesus is going to come back. And I know for sure that Dad will stretch and he and his angel will chat with those around them as they rise in glory. But Mom, Mom is going to jump right up because she and her angel are going to speed up. She's got things to do and she's never late. And I know, I know the jokes have St. Peter at the pearly gates, but I suspect in reality it might be Mom windmilling her arms and saying, come on, come on, where have you been? Where's your father? I suppose he's late again. And when we arrive, she's going to pull us in close with a hug that almost hurts. You know what I mean, right, grandkids? She's going to whisper fiercely in our ear, I've been waiting for you. What took you so long? Oh, I'm so glad to see you. And she will step back, square her shoulders, and adjust her robe of light. And she will say, well, come in, come in. Jesus and I have had dinner ready for a half an hour, and don't track muck on those golden streets. Wipe your feet. Come on in. This is not on your program, but recently we were going through all the photos trying to collate them and make them make sense. As I went through the final ones and handed them to Dr. Tim Blackwelder, who is doing the projection tonight, and by the way, thank you, and there's Steve Tatro doing the lighting. I'm not sure that I like that, but that's okay. And Carlton Cross and Scott Duncan are doing the sound. It takes a lot of people to do a small program. It takes a lot of people to understand what goes on. And with that, this short little segment here that wasn't planned is because a lot of you knew our mom in different lights, whether she was a co-worker, a colleague, or a mom that was full of fun, or a mom that was telling you didn't do anything right. Some of you knew her in different ways. Each of us kids also knew her in different ways. Sometimes I had an under, a hard time understanding those ways. But there's a few people here that can attest to the stress that we put in her life additionally like the Hillies, who I had just walked past there in the hallway, who lived two doors down from us for quite some number of years. Like Andy Dressler, who I noticed was there in the aisle, who lived in the apartment underneath mom and dad, who I had the privilege of washing his VW, and then having dad get up during supper to go take a look at that VW that wasn't quite washed right. So many stresses were applied in different ways. Mom passed on Friday the 24th. Sabbath morning, I woke up with kind of a different thought process. If you would start the first slide, please, Tim. Yeah. That's mom. If you notice, she has a big smile on her face, riding a crazy little Bridge and Stratton mini bike 
which we for about a month had been told that we couldn't buy with our own money because it was dangerous. And yet she was still willing to get on the thing when we begged her. I don't remember how many times she went in a circle in the driveway, but obviously she was having fun. So she was willing to try different things regardless of the stresses that we put on. Next picture, please. When we were very young, I believe that's my sister, Jenna, we learned to sail because that was a passion of dad's. I don't know how many of you were here that went through all of the slides while you were seating and so forth, but there was a few slides showing that mom and dad had gone boating before us kids even came around. But this slowly was being done because dad figured out that it was cheaper to rent a sailboat for a week than it was to pay for motels. So we would go either to Rosario or direct to Anacortes, rent a sailboat, and go around the San Juan Islands and learn what jibing was, when to tack, when to not trip over the ropes, how to make the ropes neat and clean, and if you were on deck, it was time to work, not just lay down and sunbathe. We learned that when the captain said move, it was probably time to move, not question why. It might be that the boom was swinging because he had tacked and you were standing in the middle of that and it would hit you in the ear. We also learned that mom did not appreciate sailing very much. She was a fair weather sailor. Only <laughs> I see you laughing, Leonard. So, next slide, please. So, this is Dad and some goofy kid learning to sail in very foul weather across the Georgia Strait. I remember this specifically. And it's interesting because Mom's the one that took the picture. Waves were breaking over the top of the sailboat in the front, and we were getting wet in the back. She did not come out of the cabin and did not come up the gangway. Next picture, please. However, the gangway was her space. Why? She could sit there, she could have fresh air, she could be in the sun, or not with the hat, and still control what was in the cabin and see what was about to happen on the boat. Notice that she's holding, you can't see it, but it is a navigational map. I don't recall ever having her on a boat where she wasn't making food, washing dishes with Jenna, and navigating with the map. Dad was very exact in how to pay attention to the buoys, and Mom was very exact what the heading should be. Dad would counteract with the wind direction, and Mom was very exact in what the heading should be. Next picture, please. This is about the most fair weather gear she ever put on. And what was odd to me is that not only was she paying attention to her family, I have seen her be seasick time after time after time, either because she wouldn't come up out and enjoy what we called the fair weather, but she was still there. Next picture, please, Tim. This one really caught my attention. I don't think I'd ever seen this picture. Whatever they're doing, I don't know. 
looking for a buoy, looking at seals, maybe some whales. We ran into them frequently, but they're doing it together. Mom's in the gangway with binoculars. So she obviously wasn't comfortable. She wasn't up in a seat, but she was still there. Next, please. The point is, on Sabbath morning when I woke up, George had called me Friday and said that we had bad news. I met him there. We dealt with things as best we could. And Saturday morning, I woke up realizing that she had been there for our lives consistently seasick. I believe there was a picture prior to this too where she had two kids in her arms and was kind of joking around in the kitchen when dad took the picture. But it probably wasn't a joke with four of us being that way. But she was still there. I thought that was important.
every person who ever lived on this earth, who walked its dusty streets, who sat under the shade of its trees, who drank its water, who ate its food, and every person who does that now, and every person who will do it in the future, will find that life is characterized by certain incontrovertible truths. The first one is that life for us as human beings has a beginning. That's not something any of us have a choice about because it rests in the hands of others. And as our rancorous political debates currently reveal, we don't seem to have a very clear consensus as to precisely when human life should be counted. But that being aside, life for all of us has a beginning. The second incontrovertible truth about life is that life as we know it will have an ending. It's not something we contemplate much. It's not something we think much about. It's not something we anticipate. But it is something that lingers out in front of all of us as a reality. And we may debate what actually death is, what constitutes death, what happens. Some people believe that when you die, the evolutionary experience is over and you're done. Other people believe that there's a part of you that escapes death and goes on to some other form of existence. And some believe that when you die, you will rest for a while, but there will be a future for you. The third incontrovertible truth is that in the journey between those two dates, we all face every day considerable vulnerability. At every stage of our existence, from pregnancy to old age, we are vulnerable. There are all manner of things that can disturb the flow of our lives a misplaced foot, a bad decision, a wrong look, a miscalculation, the appearance of an unwanted disease, there are untold number of things that can disturb the flow of our lives. And the challenge every human being faces is to navigate this journey in such a way as to make it as long and trouble-free as possible. And the challenge is like this, that in front of every human being, and the younger you are, the more this is true. In front of every human being lies a whole list of possibilities. We cannot number them. There are so many, especially when we're young. There are so many of them that they cannot all be realized in a single life. And so we are left to choose which ones we will actualize, which possibilities will become realities in our lives. And they're interesting things because when you elect one possibility, you eliminate a whole bunch of other ones. And somebody once described life as a journey through declining possibilities. I don't think it's a little pessimistic, but there is a certain truth in it. And possibilities, when they become actualized in our lives, change their nature. They become indelible. They enter life, the stream of history, as something that eternity itself will not change. They are actualized. And furthermore, each possibility comes with, or with consequences. And we love to avoid consequences for our actions and behaviors, but in the long run, the possibilities that are actualized in your life bring with them possibilities that remain. And so the great challenge in life, because there's no rewind button, the great challenge is to live in such a way as to minimize vulnerability so that we live long, but also to live in such a way that we accumulate a host of good consequences in our lives that hopefully spill out into the lives of others. And as I get older, I am quite envious of or quite appreciative of Viktor Frankl's famous comment where he said that a person who has managed to live long and accumulate a great collection of good consequences in their lives would be foolish to trade that for the mere potentiality of youth. You can think about that a little bit if you want. But folks, it's against this reality of life. It's up against that rubric that we measure the lives of people, our own and the lives of other people whom we know. If vulnerability overtakes somebody in an untimely manner, we count it as tragic. 
If life gets encumbered by bad consequences, we see it as diminished. If people make foolish decisions, we sorrow and maybe even pity them and sometimes try to help them. But as I listen to people talk about Jane Ann, whom we are commemorating today, when we hold her life up against this background, she comes out looking very good. Not only did she live a long life, she lived a good life. I searched around looking for evidences of some foolishness in her life, some chapters of, of, um, of um, what shall I say, um, foolishness. I didn't find them. She was a person who all her life made good decisions. She exercised prudence. She took actions that brought good consequences into her life and into the lives of many others around her. Her life was a long life with no chapters given to foolishness. There's no record of her ever going over the proverbial fool's hill. She left an enviable record of devotion to her husband, her children, her work, her church, and her God. And I was particularly impressed by the discovery that she was an active member of this congregation for 62 years. I don't know if that's a record or not, probably not, given the way communities like this happen. But active in a community, 62 years, a faithful participant in church life. And though she was a quiet person, not one much given to the, be in the public eye, um, her long life of quiet devotion leaves a record that I believe will stand up against even that of the great luminaries in history. And I would remind you good people here today that we oftentimes get things upside down in our thinking. We tend to think sometimes that the people who, the guy who has the most at the end wins. We think that the rich and the famous are the ones whom we ought to emulate. But in the economy of God, it's upside down to that. It's quiet people who live faithful lives who are the great champions in the kingdom of God. And the long life of faithfulness is an act of great faith. You think about it, how every day a person orients themselves to the God they serve and they make their decisions in accordance with that. Like a beacon out in front of them, it draws them ever forward in hopes of seeing what they only believe. That's the life I see in this good woman. We all know that death was not a part of God's original plan for humans. And because of that, it is always an intruder. It never comes as a welcome guest. When death comes, we feel robbed. We feel cheated. We feel like a wrongness has settled around us. We, we live with vacancies in life that were once filled by vibrant and loving people. Death is an enemy. But I rejoice with you today in being able to remind you that there is good news. Because in the middle of all of this, we know Jane Ann was a devoted Christian, which means that we are entitled to look at the promises of the Bible made about what comes next. And you know what comes next in the scripture, she will lie in her grave until the day of a great resurrection. And I have rejoiced over the years in the realization that as far as the Bible is concerned, whatever hope you and I have of eternity is not linked to some amorphous, ethereal, apparently immortal soul kind of a thing. That's not where the promise of the future is anchored. It is anchored in the promise of a resurrection. You can find it scattered in the Old Testament and pronounced loudly in the New Testament that there is coming a day of resurrection. And the Bible is very clear that since Jesus conquered death, he will be entitled to bring those who have died believing in him along with him. There's an interesting phrase in the New Testament, it's in Christ. It speaks about people being in Christ. And if you study that in some detail, you will make a discovery that whether a person is physically alive and in Christ or whether they are dead and in Christ, the final outcome of their lives will not be different. If you are a believer in Christ and have placed your trust in him, it doesn't matter whether you live or die. In the end, the outcome will be one for you. And so it is that I would like you to, to consider just two passages of scripture briefly here 
as I conclude my comments this afternoon. The first one is a single verse in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. This is not saying that death is a blessing. It is saying blessing are those who have died in the Lord. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors for their deeds follow them. <coughs> this is talking about the fact that all of us leave a record in life, and blessed are those who die leaving a sterling record. It lingers beyond them. The other text is one that you know maybe even by heart from 1 Thessalonians, where the Apostle Paul, looking forward, looking first of all at the Thessalonians who were grieving the loss of loved ones, reminded them that, that they should not be uninformed, that they could sorrow, but they should not sorrow without hope, because, he, he said, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. This, I think, is the blessed hope of those of us who believe. It is anchored in the, lives of, in the life of Christ and the victory he won at Calvary, but it shines forth as a hope that we're entitled to when we look at the lives of those who believe. And with that, I offer you words of comfort and hope that the day will come when we will be reunited once again. bow your heads with me. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this Sabbath day, a day of rest, and a day to remember and be thankful for the many days and years of care and love from our mother. It is also a comfort to know that she is now resting peacefully as our loved ones of many in this very place some long ago, some more recently, and even her sister just about a year and a half ago. Please, we ask that you present the same comfort and hope to any and all that are grieving. And as we just heard from Dad, once again, as he would want it to remind us, yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>